Arteta! What a strike! One freaking home game. One game in the Premier League. One start. And already the Ceballos hype is over the top. It's out of control. It's totally outrageous. We're going to see if we can top it. This is the Arsenal Vision Postmatch Podcast. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter at Yankee Gunner. And we are going to get really worked up about Danny Ceballos. And he deserves it. He was brilliant. But there's more to a game than just Danny Ceballos, sadly. So we'll talk about the stuff that happened that wasn't Danny Ceballos. But also, Aubameyang scored. So I'll like that. Obviously, we'll have the segment where Elliot begs for appreciation for uh, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. A little bit of uh, housekeeping. We've got this podcast coming up for you. Late in the week, we will do either on YouTube or just on Mixler a live uh, pre-Liverpool pregame kind of show game preview kind of show probably on friday so look for that and then on wednesday we will have patron pod my guess is it will be match spotlight danny ceballos but since this could turn into that uh maybe it'll wind up being a, a mailbag or something but we'll figure that out in any event paul's on twitter at pause in my pants hello pause Woo-hoo. really <laughs> clive's on twitter at clive pafc hello clive hello hello tim's on twitter at stoberto hello tim hello there hello there indeed okay so <clears throat> this is this is a rock solid pod. I mean, we're jammed with stuff to talk about. We can make fun of Sean Dyche and Ashley Barnes. We can uh, wax lyrical about Danny Ceballos. We can go on about our strikers bailing us out again. We can have a laugh at Chelsea, who I think are in big, big trouble. All of that and uh, and the Manchester United game still to come after we're done recording this. But I think the best place to start, Tim, is probably to skip the whole what do you think of the lineup, what do you think of the formation, all that stuff, and maybe just dig into Danny Ceballos from the start I think that's the headline of the game. I think that's the thing we want to devote the most time to. So let's start there. Um, I think in the first game, Willick was playing 10. I don't know that it totally suited him. We saw Newcastle pack the midfield, and he struggled to get into the game. Um, and so Ceballos played in this game, and what I think is really interesting, we'll talk about touch maps and heat maps and and you know how it changed over the course of the game, but he, he did the thing that maybe Willick couldn't, which is he was constantly dropping a shoulder, finding a pocket of space, faking out his marker and, and moving into open positions. One of the things I loved about his game more than anything was just his ability to be available to receive a pass because we played out from the back a lot and Burnley pressed more than I expected. So this is a long-winded way of saying, what do you think Ceballos added to our midfield that we've been lacking without him? I, I think he added an awful lot that we've been lacking. Um, I mean, one of the simple and slightly, I think often slightly reductive things to do is uh, because it's quite natural for us as football fans as we start thinking about the players who've left in recent years. And I'm sure I wasn't the only one that was thinking, Cazorla's back. <laughs> <laughs> I may have had a tweet like that, yes. <laughs> Re- rejoice. Um, but the, the interesting thing is he, he does um, his kind of Cazorla thing slightly higher up the pitch, whereas, you know, when Santi was at his best for Arsenal, he was kind of doing that in front of the defence, evading the press. But I, I think Arsenal have players there at the moment, uh, namely Gendouzi. And when well, he's not pressed too hard, Jacker, who can who can kind of take care of that area, um, maybe better than, say, Francis Coquelin could technically. Um, and so he can do things a little bit higher up. And I, I also just think, the midfield had a much more modern look to it. It looked like a Premier League midfield in 2019 rather than, you know, the old Windows 7 analogy I used on the last pod. It which just I looked, loved. <laughs> which, you know, because you've got Will and Emery spoke about this. You've got Willock and Ceballos interchanging. And that's, you know, again, it's always tempting to just look at what the good teams are doing and, and say, well, let's do that. But, you know, who, who's Man City's number 10? Is it De Bruyne or Sil- Silva? It's neither and both of them. Who is Spurs' number 10? Ericsson or Ali? Neither and both of them. You know, who's Liverpool's number 10? Nobody. Like, for, you know, for that, me that's no. just yeah. <laughs> not really how elite teams line up anymore. And I I actually, I really like the um, the look of the kind of partnership between Willock and Ceballos because I think they have different qualities and Ceballos's qualities are clearly on the ball he's he's just superb at wriggling away from people and he's got that faint and that drop of the shoulder which you know is very Santi-esque that we've been missing but I really like Willock both off the ball 
I think even at Newcastle the other week, I think the thing is with Willock that I really like is whether he plays in the double pivot or he plays in that kind of almost false number 10 role, he always seems to know where to stand. And um, and the thing is, so I think being a number 10, as it were, is quite a rough deal in an Emery team because he likes his number 10s to be decoys, basically. So And that's one of the reasons Mesut Ozil doesn't enjoy it because he gets like 15 touches a game because the whole idea is that the wide forwards come in field and almost play like dual number 10s. And then the actual number 10's job is to get forward and support the striker, which, you know, only Aaron Ramsey could really do effectively last season. Um, but I, I think I still think Willock can do that quite effectively. Um, but I really liked um, them kind of swapping over. And what I liked about Ceballos, I, I think we gave him a freer reign. Because if you look at, um, I mean, I love the assist for the second goal because it's a goal in transition. It's just the type of goal Arsenal never score anymore. That kind of turning, you know, forcing the other team to turn the ball over high up. And when you're playing teams that defend in such a condensed way like Burnley, that's how you get them. You know, you force them into a turnover and then the ball's with Aubameyang and he's just lightning quick in those situations. And I loved that. And if you notice Ceballos' position, he's right over on the left at that point. And that's not where he was for the whole game. But he had this nice tendency to wander around. And even, at you know, towards the end where we were having real problems kind of playing out. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about this. That gave us structural problems because it creates big gaps in the team. Because I think Willock perhaps and Genduzi were going right onto the edge of the area and getting penned in. But Ceballos just kept picking up that space in the middle, and we should have used it more. Um, I think Leno really should have been lobbing a few, or, or Louise should have been lobbing a few more passes into there. But he just. Um, you know, I had a really good opportunity to watch him from my seat in like the upper tier. And he, he just had a wonderful appreciation of space as, as well as his kind of more obvious qualities on the ball and, and wriggling away from players. And, and I was I was thinking about it on the way home and I was trying to think of like the best home debuts I've ever seen. Um, and, and this is up there. This is up there. It's not quite the one I settled on was Vieira against Sheffield Wednesday in 1996 which um Clive I'm sure you'll remember that was the one where you come away and you go wow what a player we have here and it, it wasn't was life quite changing. It was a life yeah. changing moment it really was yeah and and it wasn't quite of that vintage um you know maybe, maybe like Glenn Helder's home debut um but you know it, it was just this kind of wow yes that is exact that is that's re- not only is that really impressive but that's just all the qualities we've been missing for such a long time and uh don't get me wrong he uh, and you know it was Burnley so that's a very different type of test but you know the the next two games i think will tell us a bit more about where he is and 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 you know ultimately where the team is at the moment well but i think it's it's interesting right cuz everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth and i think when you go in to face burnley you expect Low block, defending with eight men behind the ball, all the way in their penalty area, blocking shots and playing long. And they came out and pressed. They pressed way up the pitch. They were incredibly aggressive with their press. And that's exactly the kind of thing that you could have exploited Arsenal with just a season ago. But in fact, it didn't work for them. And I thought our best period of the game was early on when they were pressing aggressively and we were able to get out of it. And Clive, I mean, I think to me, the reason this is such an encouraging full full debut, you know, a start for him is if you said to me what's an area where Arsenal have to get better if they want to move up a level, I'd say they have to be more press resistant in midfield. They have to be able to take the ball under pressure in their defensive third and play their way out. And if you look at the heat map from the game, like a big red chunk of the heat map is our own defensive third, but that's not because Burnley had it and had us hemmed in. It's because we really meticulously played out and around their aggressive press, and I, I loved seeing it, and Ceballos was a big part of that. So would you say that his, the addition of his press resistance, his ability to find pockets of space, wriggle away from pressure, and, and progress the ball is the sort of missing ingredient from midfield that we've needed? Yeah, amongst many things. <laughs> I, think, um, I think, obviously, Arsenal fans, we're conditioned to having these tricky or manipulators like Claire Brzezicki, Fabregas, you know, even Van Persie <clears throat> mentioned that name. Um, Claire, these, these players are just fantastic. Santi, obviously, 
So Sabias so fits our eye, to take one of your sayings earlier. Mm-hmm. He fits so he fits our eye. Right? So we like that. Immediately we love him. But it wasn't just what he did on the ball. It's as Tim alluded to, it's what he did off the ball. So the way I saw the midfield three, you almost had they were very they were very clever how they created a release valve. So you had two playing tight, but the third one was always around the corner in a bit of space, either higher up or wider out. So you go tip tap release you know so he was Tobias went high or Willock went high or Quinduzi went to the left so they can press an area you go tip tap out and you then you can travel and I thought that was beautiful construction of the midfield uh, Tim's analogy about the modern midfield what we're seeing is the ability to solve problems being set by other people and that to me just warms my heart if we can hold on to this you know, rather than create problems in that space, we solve problems in that space and then sprung from that area. If anything, we left two goals easily in transition on the pitch. That could have been 4-1, right? Now, if the gamble of playing in the area close to your goal versus a team like Burnley who just want to do exactly that, is get you close to your goal and keep you there. That is exactly what they want. And if they can keep it in your area, it's even better. So we were playing the game that they absolutely wanted and we did it with confidence and then got out. We didn't punish them enough was probably my only sort of issue. Tobias brings that, give it, Tobias and Pepe, they both bring that sort of give it to me quality. And again, that's something we're used to. We're used to having swagger. We're used to having strut. We're used to having the most technical players around. And I saw that the weekend. And then I saw it other players trying their tricks like Maitland Niles and other people getting more comfortable in possession, wanting the ball, feeding off the confidence of having a real leader in the middle of the pitch. And I felt it permeated to the other players. I didn't go to this game, but I can almost, without even asking Tim, I guaranteed it permeated to the to the stands. The confidence, the technical ability, the ball playing ability. And it just felt like we were watching an Arsenal team again. And I know we've spoken a lot about style and Emery's style. I've always felt it's, it's been in within the players. The quality of player will dictate the style and how you play a system, how they handle pressure, how they handle adversity, how they trans, how they solve problems. I've always felt it's within the players. So the development of the players has always been key for me. The addition of these players, you're starting to see not just a consistent build-up, but you're starting to see a lift in quality and a lift in focus, particularly in offensive areas and defensive areas. Mm. And you're starting to see partnerships develop. And I, I know we've got a couple of tough games coming up. So, you know, me, I'm, I'm, I'm more positive than negative. I'm struggling to hold on to my enthusiasm because the real test is coming up. But whatever happens, if we can hold this feeling and hold this progression, I really feel we're in for a really exciting season. Well, and I mean, look, this is the tip of the iceberg because, you know, whatever we think of Maitland-Niles, Bellerin is getting him back is huge and Tierney coming in for Nacho, who I think has actually played reasonably well through two games, but doesn't have the athleticism is huge and getting Pepe fully integrated will be massive. And Louise is just starting to to figure things out. I mean, we saw him play one ball over the top to Aubameyang. That's just tantalizing in terms of what it could mean if we see more of that throughout the season. Um, you know, especially if teams try to push a little higher up and Aubameyang can run off the last shoulder. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff to get excited about, but Paul, the, the thing that I, I also think you can look at in this Ceballos performance is that he really played two roles at two points in the game. Mm-hmm. He dropped deeper to help us play out from the back and support Ganduzi and, and Willock early in the game when the press was more intense and when we needed that extra body deeper in midfield. Later in the game, before he was taken off, obviously, because after he's taken off, he wasn't in the game, um, he, he played a lot in the more advanced midfield on the left flank and, and took up more of a number 10 role. I mean, granted, a little a little on the left half space, not so much central, but more of the 10 roll when we change things around a little bit. So in terms of the versatility, I think that's another really key point because we have a lot of interesting midfielders now. And if Ceballos can be an eight stroke 10, kind of like what Tim was talking about, if he can be De Bruyne some days and Silva some days, I mean, if he could be either of those, it'd be amazing. But you you know what I'm saying? If he can be an eight stroke 10, you now have a lot of, uh, a lot of flexibility in terms of how you want to build the midfield. Yeah. 
I mean, Tim mentioned Willock being a, a bit of a false 10. I think Sabalos... He looks more comfortable deeper to me, just personally. He does. Um, and But, you know, he's just learning the game. Uh, yeah. Sabalos, is, how many times has Willock played a 10 for a senior team? So I think he'll get a lot smarter at that. But um, who fascinated, fascinates us at the moment is Sabalos. And... Um, you know, he plays the falsest of tens. Basically, when we're in position, uh, in possession, he'll drop back. He's basically another midfielder. Um, he drops real deep. He might be the slightly more advanced of the three, but but they rotated between the three of them. Um, that was the beautiful thing. Um, they they really just mixed in and found a way to play out. And Sabalas basically lives in two spots. He lives in that uh, a three man midfield when we're playing our way out and then he trots over to that pocket over on the left, occasionally on the right, cause the game will take him that way. But from what I could see about a two to one ratio, he loves trotting over to that left corner and help help him kind of knead and fold the dough in that corner. Um, I actually think the most representative assist he played was the third one, the one for the Nelson goal that got waved off with Monreal doing the cut coming in from the left and, and uh, uh, doing the cutback for Nelson, who popped, and, and how we'd feel differently about the game if that, about Nelson's game if that goal had stood. Um, but those are the breaks. But but it's Sabalas on that corner there, folding the dough, just kind of working it back and forth with to play Monreal through. And that's kind of to me that's the classic Sabalas in the attacking part of the field. He doesn't really play through the center. Um, he's very good at switching the play, and I think he lives in two places. And as you said, I, I don't think there was a huge difference between what he was trying to do in the first half and the second half. It was just a reflection of how much of the ball we had and and uh, kind of the dynamics of the game rather than we did something uh, t- uh, tactically different with Sabalas. Um, a- as we got more of the game in the second half, he spent more of the time in that pocket over on the left left-hand side uh, being the playmaker, pulling the strings. Um, and, and to Tim's earliest point, I mean, you can do a line of players who have brought that to our midfield, that level of excitement and energy and ability to control and ability to play out and to dominate. They're all Spanish, and it's basically Fabregas, Arteta, Cazorla, and now Sabalos. And there's, no, there's nobody else you can really put in that pocket of players who... Uh, were kind of mi- central midfielders who drove the play forward for us and who set the tempo of the game and who all the other players would look to for solutions. And it's absolutely uh, enthralling uh, to, <clears throat> to uh, have that player in place. I was shocked by those two tweets he put out, though. Did you see them? <laughs> which which ones were these? The one he, he had, one about Zidane, he said, uh, come suck my dick. Mm. And then his other tweet to Florentino was that his daughter was a fat slag, and when he got back to Madrid, he was going to nail her. Wow. I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't really like anything about that. If I'll be honest, I no. mean, even even though you're presenting no. it as as a possible positive because it means he won't go back to Madrid, I think um, well, I think it also makes him of sort of sort of a misogynist. So I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure perhaps. I love it. Him um, or me. To I'm be not fair, sure he which. does actually have a, a social media post out there from years ago uh, that was pretty politically incorrect as it relates to uh, Catalan independence. So, so. Yeah, but it wasn't that, it wasn't that funny. <laughs> no, it wasn't nearly as funny as, as your unfunny one. <laughs> um, Tim, you know, you know, look, the the thing that really excites me about this, and I don't think it can just be pinned on Ceballos. I think Willick has a lot to do with it. I think Ganduzi has a lot to do with it. I think... It's the switch from the back three to the back four. But last season, one of the things we talked a lot about that drove me nuts was our our distances. It was very Mm -hmm. common for a a wing back to have the ball or a center back to have the ball or one of the double pivot players to have the ball last season and there was no Arsenal player within 15 yards of them. And they'd just be looking up and they'd go wind up going back to a defender. They'd wind up going laterally and, and the ball couldn't move forward. Now, in the first game, we struggled because I think Willick at the 10 didn't necessarily always get his distance right and couldn't find the spaces in a very packed midfield, uh, midfield packed with Newcastle players. But in this game, I love the distances. I felt like Ceballos was always within three yards of whoever had the ball. 
Ganduzi mm. had the ball. Sabayos was right there giving him an, an option. Willick had the ball. Sabayos was right there giving him an option. A fullback had the ball. I, I feel like Sabayos was right there giving him an option. And so the distances looked right. As far as the spacing across the pitch, is that something you noticed in this game? You know, as as Burnley were trying to to really shrink the space and pressure us in our own half, it looked like we really had that problem from last season sorted out. Yeah, I think so. Other other than from our own goal kicks, I didn't I didn't really sense any of uh, that kind of stodgy trying to get the ball up the pitch and like, you know, trying to push a boulder uphill um, kind of feeling that I had. Um, and I think it's reasonably obvious why that is, is you know, I don't, I don't know, maybe this is like a preconceived bias of mine kicking in, but I think when you have like a midfield three and two of them are Xhaka and Ozil, what you've got are two guys who kind of do very definite things. You know, you've got like a guy like Xhaka who, you know, look, uh, he hasn't become like an absolutely awful, useless in all scenario players, all scenarios player. Um, <laughs> Mustafi. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, indeed. He, he hasn't become Mustafi yet. You know, I, so I, I don't want to just like completely shit on him and just be like, yep, that's it. His, his career is over because he'll play. Uh, he'll play plenty and um you know that's fair enough because there's there's a lot of games but I, yeah i just feel like when you've got like Xhaka and Ozil your distances are quite definite it's it's quite obvious what both of those guys want to do whereas what we had in midfield i think on saturday was three fairly like all-rounder type of players you know like Genduzi I said in pre-season that I found it interesting that even when partnered with Xhaka Genduzi was the one who was going deeper and I think what we're seeing is that that's how um, Emery really sees him as the kind of receiver and distributor at the base of midfield he was definitely doing that and it was Willock and Ceballos who were swapping um, and I, I find that really interesting and I and you know I tweeted on Friday that I think the decision not to absolutely confirm Xhaka as captain. Um, I think you can follow the thinking here and we know how much he likes Genduzi. Um, he's got, you know, he's got options in that double pivot, hasn't he? Um, and yet Genduzi is the one who's played 90 minutes in both games. Torreira's not started yet. Uh, Ceballos has sat one out. Jack has had to sit one out, I guess. Genduzi is the one who's played and he's played 90 minutes both times. Um, so we know how much he trusts Genduzi and Basically, Genduzi, he seems to have earmarked for the, you know, the Xhaka role, but obviously he does it in a slightly different way and that he's a bit more mobile and he's a bit more alive. Um, and, and I think his, his distribution is very smart as well. And, you know, to be honest, I don't I, I think he's got a good through ball, but I think he can do that from deep. I don't think, as we saw when he had that chance in the first half, I don't think he's great in the final third. So I'm I'm quite happy for him to be in that deeper position. But yeah, the, the distances were great because, you know, we had like, what was that quote from Emery at the end of last season where he's talking about his midfielders and he said, oh, this guy's a six and an eight and an eight and this guy's a four and a six. And, you know, what what we had really were three guys who can play number eight effectively but you know Genduzi was in the deeper role Sabayos and, Will and Willock were kind of swapping um the the number 10 uh kind of role so it, it was just it was a lot more fluid and when yeah. you've got that kind of fluidity instead of like Jacka sat right on top of his center backs trying to find Ozil who's you know trying to find a little crevice of space next to the center forwards it's just it's too big a distance it's too easy to shut that down Whereas, you know, when you've got three guys who interchange a little bit better, you know, you've got the kind of short passing options there. You can you can do the pop the ball off one touch stuff. We, so we've got in Genduzi and I'd say David Luiz, we've got guys who can like who can ping the ball or who can find the fullbacks, find the wide players. But then we've got guys who can come and join in and, and do the kind of short connecting stuff. So I, I, th I thought the midfield was the most notable thing about the performance because I'm not entirely sure the defending was that much different. I thought, but I think Burnley are a much better attacking team than people think. Um, and they give a, you know, they beat Southampton three nil last mm, week. Yeah. You know, they, they aren't just, I, I think they've evolved since they came up. I think they're much more threatening. Um, and Woods is, is a great signing for them. Um, you know, about 18 months ago, they got him from Leeds. He's, he, he reminds me a bit of what um, like John Waters was doing for Stoke when 
they were any good just that kind of really good support striker role and it's really really difficult to pick up and Okazaki does it and Iosi Perez does it and those players are really difficult to pick up um, and I think we had problems with that um, and you know with their strikers pulling off wide onto the fullbacks and things like that I, I still don't think we looked that convincing with that and look the strikers were the strikers they again um, took their chances and that was mm-hmm. that but the the, the notable change is the midfield um and that and you know that's because all three of those midfielders are all right Willock's an academy player but they've all made their debut within the last 12 months and two of them have made their first team debut within like the last three months so that's that's a brand new midfield and i i feel really positive about this because i think this is an indication of where emery wants to go and i think it's it's where any manager worth his salt would go at the moment yeah, I, I agree. The age of our, our th- midfield three was 21 years old um, yeah. against the lads. Good point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, I think you look at it too, and under a lot of pressure, um, you know, Ganduzi misplaced three passes all game. He was 94.7%. Ceballos, you know, he, he played a few more progressive passes, uh, uh, more difficult passes, you might say, but completed them at, Ninety percent, Joe Willock and missed, one of yep. the uh, sorry, what one that Ceballos messed up? Um, he immediately went and got back, and we scored a goal. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and Willock was eighty seven point five percent. So when you're under pressure and you have three central midfielders, the worst one is eighty eight percent, and the other two are over ninety. What that tells you is they're not being forced to make twenty yards pass twenty yard passes to get out of pressure. They've got the little three, four, five yard pass out, and that was really important. And they helped each other really well. And I just think you look at Ceballos' work rate, his trickery, his cleverness, his movement might be as important as anything, but it is absolutely brilliant to see a couple of midfielders all working for each other to get in a position to help progress the ball pitch, get around pressure, and get going. And Clive, I think if anything, maybe the misgiving in this game is that after they did get around that pressure, the guys up in front of them maybe didn't do as much as they could have. I know Nelson could have played Aubameyang in once and took sort of a wild shot. Um, Lacazette, I felt, really struggled to get into this game, as did Aubameyang at times. Um, of course, they both score, and that's the the challenge I think Emery has is both of them scoring makes you believe both of them should be on the pitch, and rightfully so, but are we best with both of them on the pitch? I felt that the front three maybe struggled to do enough with the opportunities created by breaking the pressure from the midfield. So for you, how do you feel about the way the Nelson Lacazette Aubameyang front three worked? And and if maybe we left some, some scoring opportunities out there because they weren't quite at their best. I think we have to give uh, Burnley some credit for why they weren't at their best. I think um, we got our first goal, sunny day. Thank you. A few beers. Great stuff. We sat back after that, didn't we? We we kind of took our foot off the gas. Well, we just thought it was going to be nice. I I, I started to think about 5-0. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I was getting excited, thinking, yeah. It's people like you that are the problem, Clive. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll, I'll just back to tweet out, we're going to thrash these. And then they started, uh, <laughs> good job. I, I, I went onto Discord and I thought, should I say something? Oh, no, nah, keep, your mouth, keep yourself quiet. Because Dwight McNeil started to get the ball. And he's a very good player. He trained with England first team squad last season and did very well in training. He's an England 19 player, just been playing on 21s. He is a very, very good player. Right? Would not look out of place in our team. And he started to get the ball. And that was on a Bamiyang side. So when you play a Bamiyang high right, as he was in the first half, you want him to stay there because you want him isolated, right? You want the, you want the out ball. You don't want him to come deep. So, that, so Eric Peters and and Dwight McNeil, McNeil had a bit of fun down our right hand side, and like I'm thinking, we're struggling a bit here. He's getting good pressure, and I don't want a Bamiyang to come back. And so I was thinking, swap swap them over, get a Bamiyang on the left, and get Nelson on the right, who his natural Britishness will, will come back and track back, and and we want a Bam, we want a Bamiyang higher, right? We can give we can give up Nelson's goal scoring ability. We want a Bamiyang higher. The, for me, the attacking space was always on on uh, Burnley's right back slot on the left-hand side. And so I thought they did quite well in playing territory football and we sort of played into their hands. And once we started giving corners away and throws away, we're now in an area where they want us to be. 
away from disconnected from our forwards. And so I don't, I can't remember any glaring mistakes from our forwards. I just remember that disconnect. And I always get worried about that mm. when we disconnect from the forwards, like we did in the Europa League final, and we lose these players. Their spirit just goes into a hole and we lose them. And I was saying to myself, change it, Emery, change it. Get Nelson swapped over. Get a Bamiyang free on the left. Monreal's much better providing combinations. I thought Maitland Niles started a little bit slow, a little bit sleepy. And and we was under a little bit of pressure. That's okay. That's Premier League football, right? You won't you won't dominate the whole game. I thought Emery did really well by adjusting by taking Nelson off, who I think did nothing wrong but by bringing on Pepe, you added another massive personality to the game. So if you think back to the Newcastle game, we had Mikatarian and we had Shaka playing. We replaced them really with Sabias and um, and Lacazette, two big men personalities. Then you take out Nelson, then you add Pepe. So suddenly we've got struck and personality and I think that's what's got us back into the game. We could get that connection again to our top two and we start to look dangerous. I wouldn't say it's a problem of, of the of the front two. If anything, I think Aubameyang's, you know, I don't want to start you off earlier, but as he ran forward for his goal, I mean, we were all shouting goal before he was even took the so so good. Off drive. <laughs> I mean that, so good. that was that was just ridiculous. Right? We all, everybody was shouting goal before he'd even before he'd even struck it. Right. So, um, so he's got something going on there. You know, I was querying his ability to play on the left. Well, he's done a shake and bake, drop shoulder, come inside, bang, goal. And I'm thinking we've well, learned that pretty quickly. Right. Do you see what I mean? So, um, mm. his numbers last season from left hand side, his dribbles, you know them. They weren't great compared to the right hand side. So there you go. First time on the left, bang, touch inside goal. So he's solving problems, as were the whole team. So if anything, that disconnection worried me. Um, the fact we I know you might go into defensive actions, but the fact we are a little bit deep in our box for too long concerned me. And I wonder if that's a David Luiz byproduct of where we defended very much in our box. I don't like that. I want us away from our penalty spot. But in the flip side, the pitch was big. We got good runners in midfield now. We've got problem solvers and... You know, we've got three people up front who are going to be absolutely fine. And I think we're going to be talking about these three for many, many years if they if they keep progressing like they are. And I, and I can't wait to see it. Yeah. I, so, look, Paul, I, I guess the the challenge for Emery, obviously, he's got he's got a lot of options in central midfield. I think he saw a potentially very bright future with the options he chose. The front three is a little bit interesting because I think we all presume that Pepe will graduate into being the regular starter, and maybe Nelson will be more of a spot starter, Europa League, things like that, which is fine. The Aubameyang Lacazette thing is still a curiosity to me because obviously I, I prefer Aubameyang center forward, but Lacazette could have had two goals. I mean, he takes one goal brilliantly from basically nothing on a corner kick, and then he has the other one, which is a header from the penalty spot that maybe he can do a little better, but I mean, it, it's... He does. He does about as well as he could, and it, you know, in other situations, maybe you get a goal there. So, do, do you believe that the scoring ability that those two have is such that don't overthink it, keep them both out there. Once you get Pepe in dribbling and creating some space, it'll it'll sort itself out. Or do you think that maybe it is going to have to be more of a rotation, and that each one of them can influence the game more if they have natural wingers on either side? Uh, I don't have an answer for, for it. I think you framed the question really well. There, it's not a perfectly balanced front three. Um, so I think it's going to be a bit of both, which is we'll we'll play all three, and there's so much talent among those three, it'll be okay. Especially, you know, the, we're, we got better and better wallpaper to cover the cracks with those three, with Sabias behind them, with Willock pushing on. Uh, with two wing backs coming forward, and that's going to change the dynamic a lot. When we have whoever it is, Maitland Niles or Bellerin on one side, and uh, Tierney on the other side pushing forward, and you know these are complex systems how how multiple players play together. But I think so. I think it may not be a matter uh, much of an issue for most games this season. But I do think by the end of the season, um. That friction between the three players we have for those three spots 
Um, maybe something we're talking about next summer in ster- terms of who stays and who goes. But for this year, I think we have enough. I, I think we're all feeling right now we have enough to push for Champions League, which is about uh, mostly all we care about this season. And, and although I don't think that's a perfect balanced three playing together, I, I also am still not sold on uh, the best use of Aubameyang being from the left. Uh, if they have a lower block, his inability to dribble, his lack of side-to-side unpredictability uh, means that uh, I'm a bit concerned about him there. But I think in other games, that'll be solved by Pepe uh, creating from the right, creating that unpredictability, putting in balls uh, into the box and both Lacazette and Aubameyang doing slanted runs to get on them. And Aubameyang will benefit from that. Um, bit horses for courses, but I can see games in which we have three talented players on the field, but Aubameyang seems to be basically stunted in his ability to influence the game from the left. So there will be some of those games. It's not a perfectly balanced unit. When you look at uh, Liverpool's front three, you say, now that's a perfectly balanced unit. Players playing where they should be always able to contribute in every kind of game. There'll be certain games where Aubameyang just looks a bit neutered from the left. And um, I don't think there's an easy answer because you got to play your stars and they all have goals in them. Um, but maybe we'll, uh, on days like that, we're a bit frustrated with Aubameyang from the left. Somebody else will come up with some magic from somewhere else. That's the great thing about having three, four. I mean, the, the nice thing about Sabalas was, uh, and maybe this was a little more than I expected, he got three shots off in this game. Um, the third one was pretty good, just curled around the, the low around the post from, from the central area. We Overall, we got 15 shots off, which is better than our average last season, which was more like 10 or 11. So our shot count on the offensive end, uh, all right, it's just one game. But we looked like a team that was not just... We had a lot of games last year where we seemed to have some level of control or performance or whatever, but when you actually looked at how many shots we got off, uh, the Sabayas factor with his his, uh, joker unpredictability seemed to get other people firing. Pepe will get some shots off, and he's getting a few shots off too. So uh, we may just fudge our way with a non-perfect uh, front three. I don't know what the answer is, though. I mean, Pepe's best from the right. Lacazette keeps earning a, a starting spot from the center, and Aubameyang's a generous guy in terms of where he plays, uh, probably because he can still get his goals off. So it is what it is. Yeah, I, look, I, I don't think that we have to get annoyed or panicked or worried about having two great strikers who are, are good goal scorers. I think the concern is simply when you have both of them on the pitch, do you lessen the impact of both as opposed to dramatically increasing the impact of one by only having one on the pitch? I mean, one thing I felt from preseason, and it is just preseason, Aubameyang played a good chunk of the preseason without Lacazette available, and he looked absolutely unstoppable. Um, and I... I just wonder a little bit about, you know, how mu- how much of those two are, are related, but correlation doesn't equal causation. So we'll we'll find out. Look, I think we have to take a a quick moment just to, I, I don't know, send our condolences to Ben Me, who passed away on the pitch over the weekend. Um, and and it's it's terrifying when you can actually see the moment a soul leaves a body. Um, but we we were all treated to that. Tim, uh, Pepe ended Ben Me's life and career, and, and his soul <laughs> exited his body. But apart from that deeply satisfying moment, I thought this Pepe cameo was a really interesting one because you start to see the way he can totally transform a game, force a a fullback back, keep him pinned into his half, create space by getting past players that other players couldn't get past, and then create counters that wouldn't be there otherwise. At the same point, um, you know, look, if we're just being honest, I, I thought he made a lot of mistakes in the final third one there were opportunities there was the one that you know a lot of people were upset with Aubameyang not getting a, a better shot off but I thought Pepe sold him really short on that um that pass on the counter attack where it was two on one yeah. and then and then I don't know that he's awake enough defensively you know off the ball is he tracking mm. back has he been told he doesn't need to to stay you know a little more ahead of the play to to create counters I don't know but all in all I mean what do you see in Pepe's game in terms of his readiness to come in and make a difference and maybe be a starter as soon as Liverpool? 
Yeah, I, th- I think we saw a lot of what he's about. And actually, um, he was kind of down on my side um, in the second half. So I got a very good look at him. And I thought, um, I, I think your comments are well placed. I think, first of all, we've probably learned that he's not going to be great at tracking back. I think there are a few times where um, he kind of switched off or, you know, maybe he didn't switch off. Maybe he just, just didn't, care. <laughs> didn't really bother. <laughs> it, it, um, did it against Newcastle too, by the way. There was a situation like that as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know that may be a fitness thing. I su- suspect it's not. I mean, he d- he didn't look very fit, but at the same time, I think you can already see what he's going to bring. Um, and you know, particularly with his kind of slight of foot, like he's not one of these. Um, he's not one of these wingers who's going to push the ball and run past you. Is just he's so deceptive. Um, you know, obviously you referenced that nutmeg on Ben Me, but 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 there are other little bits as well where he seems to be moving so slowly with the ball that you you just don't understand how it happens. But he just seems to have this knack of, you know, just nicking the ball away from you when you think you've got it. It's almost like he hypnotizes opponents somehow and he's like so slow and languid almost like Carnu, and you just think yeah okay i'll stick my toe out and i'll have that and all of a sudden he's just he's just got it past you it's like he always has the ball on the end of his foot you know it's never it's never like half a yard away or anything like that it's always on the end of his toe and he's always just got that kind of slight of movement Uh, what i found really interesting um and yeah and so with the not tracking back you know, that means whoever our right sided interior is in that midfield is probably going to have to do a lot of work. A bit like, you know, what Jordan Henderson does for Liverpool. He covers that right hand side and James Milner does it as well. Um, he goes and sits on that right hand side when uh, Salah and um, and Trent Alexander on go forward and, and we might have to do something like that. But I, what I found really interesting um, that I didn't really know about him or I hadn't read is just how often he drifts in field. And actually, I, I don't know if anyone noticed this. The last 10 minutes, he was playing through the center and Aubameyang moved out to the right. He did that against Newcastle um, too, by the way. I think that is yeah. absolutely by design. He makes really clever last shoulder runs. He did yeah. a lot of it at Lille too. He's a very vertical runner. He'll cut, through the, cut up through the middle. Uh, he's not really a side-to-side kind of guy from the right like no. Mahrez. And even at, right at the start of the first half, a couple of his runs were l- up the left. So he's he's very vertical. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And really so, ta- it really pins them back. Because well, what I'd say about him is I guess what I was expecting was that he's a guy that starts wide and comes into the half space. But I think yeah, what he does... No is he starts in the half space and then kind of moves a little bit more centrally. And, you know, you saw that with the breakaway that he didn't quite get to Aubameyang, but that lovely disguised through ball, he played for Aubameyang as well. That was kind of, that. that's where um, the link, I, and I completely agree with what Paul said. I, I don't think it's a perfectly balanced front three, but, you know, it, getting stuff like Pepe moving in uh, from, you know, from that kind of right hand side and people following him and then a Bamiyang sneaking, kind of sneaking around the back. You know, that that chance creation, that that gave me a lot of hope for how and they could make that drifting off to the right, which he did a bit in this game, but we've often seen it in other games. I think they can kind of fix it through movement. Exactly. Yeah. If they can all just almost like kind of tectonic plates kind of sliding around. And I think... You know that kind of Arsene Wenger quote about, you know, good players can always play together. Don't worry about it. You know, mm. <laughs> you, you always get talent, always kind of a particularly attacking talent. I think his point was always find some kind of symbiosis, uh, you know, a bit like Ursula and Sanchez, right? Like, which in one way, for me, I don't think that that was a natural duo um, or necessarily a complementary one. But it still worked and they still played the ball to each other all the time because I think talent kind of gravitates towards one another and, you know, uh, game recognized game, as it were. You know, uh, Aubameyang, he, he knew to make that run. You know, he knew like, oh, if I run up on the blind side here, I reckon he can find me. And, you know, maybe he doesn't make that run if it's, I don't know, Iwobi or even Mkhitaryan. Um Although I think Mkhitaryan's got an eye for a pass. I'm not sure he's quite got the execution all the time. But, you know, I, I think I think good players kind of do learn to understand each other. Um, but, yeah, that, that really interested me and in how often he did just drift and take up those central spaces. And I think maybe that's uh, that's potentially interesting for Ozil, um, who we've not really discussed um, yet, because, you know, Ozil's a guy that likes, you know, kind of wanders 
from in to out. And if Pepe is a guy that wanders out to in, then perhaps there's some natural synergy there um, that, you know, kind of um, makes Ozil relevant again. I, I um, think so. Perhaps. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. agree with that. Yeah, yeah. I Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was finished. That oh, was it. Perfect. Then, the, t- uh, Paul, uh, because nobody wants to hear from Clive, do you have 30 more seconds on that? <laughs> yeah, I just it's kind of an off-the-point thing. Shocker for Super. me. Yeah. But, but uh, with Pepe, he makes such vertical runs and, and, and drives people back so well. I just think it's not something we're looking to do with Pepe right now, but he does have that characteristic that makes me think you can convert that winger into a center forward in a season or two when we're looking for top level center forward. It's not what we want from him right now, but you know, he, he just, his vertical lines, his way to drive players back Mm. the, the fear of God he puts into defenders. He's physically strong. You know, he was the guy they tried to take out, uh, at Lille, just hack him down and you stop them. So, uh, you know, he embarrasses defenders all day long. He's six foot tall. Um, uh, I I think that might be interesting in a couple of seasons' time. Yeah. Well, well. all right, Clive. Welcome back. Um, Hello. <laughs> yeah. You have anything to say on Pepe? I can't imagine you do, but but if you do. Oh, you, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. fire, fire away, buddy. Well, the microphone's all yeah. yours. <laughs> Well, if okay, it's a very good video by the TIFO guys on Pepe and how he could be used at Arsenal. I think it might have been around April time. I'm sure most of the listeners have seen it, right? But dig it out. And they said they hoped to Arsenal he'd be allowed creativity because he does roam a lot. And he's already showed that roaming ability in the you know the hour that we've seen him play so far. If again, I've had a close look at him on a game video, just a, a normal game, not a highlight video. And I worked out the the back-to-goal ability, the ability to receive his standing still and start, attract two players, break out, break out from it, and then then spring, either spring by passing or spring with the ball. That's going to be great because now we've got two players that suddenly can break out of two-man presses. Um, So uh, good luck double-teaming those two. Bring it on because someone's going to benefit, and Lacazette's already. I'm sorry, a bad man already benefited in this game from broken field play and, and space on the transition. I think if you watch him very closely, he scans his shoulders a lot, and he creates separation to receive the ball to do his tricks, which means, as Tim alluded to, he can do them in his own time. Because now once he's got separation and he's got a lovely first touch and he manipulates the ball with the studs of his boots, defenders see that and they freeze. And the moment you freeze on him, you're dead. Right? So it's all done in the preparation. He works incredibly hard to receive the ball exactly how he wants to receive it. And so when it arrives, he's got the body position he needs to execute the move that he wants to execute, which regains control over his man. That's his trick. So, come on, Premier League. If you could pick the most toughest debut against the strongest defenders, the most physical defenders that you wouldn't find in another league, he's just played against them. And look what he did to them. And he's not even fit yet. The potential is scary once he gets up to speed. Um, and if you can do that against Burnley's hot carriers, what are you going to do to other teams who haven't got that level of agriculture, shall mm-hmm. we say, in their defence, that could scare a boy out of, the, out of the French League? He's not scared of anything like that. He's not bothered. He's not bothered. Bring it. Come if you come to me with your legs open. See you later. You're gone. I'll flick it over your foot here. I'll run into a space. Come and get me. I'll run past you with the ball. I'll run past you without the ball. And he's doing this, I reckon, at 65% fitness. And I tell you, I'm gonna hold it down, Clive. Hold it down. Mm-hmm. Hold it down. <laughs> hold it down. Because he's gonna be a superstar are- for us. Uh, I, 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 he's going to be a superstar. He is, and 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 everyone's feeding off. I can't wait to go to the to the next game. I can't wait to go because I want to see how it's feeding into the players from my own eyes. I, I want to feel it. I want to feel how it's feeding into the crowd. Because you said about the perfect balance, so you're probably thinking Liverpool in your mind is the perfect balance front three. Well, this group offers another balance, another way creativity, strength, extreme pace, size, 
power in Lacazette's lower body, goal scoring in all three. Uh, it's different, but it's our perfect balance. Uh, and that's yeah. what's important. It's ours. Don't think about what you think's perfect. The fact they can solve problems in all over the pitch and they're of a high quality, I think we can create our perfect balance. And what we're heading towards, for me, if you want to play adult football, you're heading for three in and three up. If those three up want to come in and create a five in midfield, if they have to invert slightly, absolutely fine. You're heading towards three in and you're talking about, it's quite interesting that Linus on the WhatsApp was talking about it could help Ozil. You've mentioned it could help, help Ozil. All I saw was Ozil being retired. Maybe. Because we, we, don't need that, we don't need that inverted left-footed pass from the right-hand side anymore. He's not, you know, he's not running pass forwards. Um, you, he's, you know not doing do, see, he's not doing the defensive pressures of Sabias, who had more defensive pressures in his 25 minutes than anybody else in the Premier League last weekend. Mm. So I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, okay, this is interesting. So if I'm Ozil now, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm taking my Beecham's and the sniffles are going away and I'm getting back on the training pitch because I've got, I've got, <laughs> <laughs> I've got to sort this out because if I want to, if I want to get my appearance money, I've got to start. I've got to start shaking a leg. We're only going to benefit from that. But if I'm right, great. If I'm wrong, great. Arsenal fans will benefit that someone's going to have to react to the fact that two players came on the pitch at the weekend and basically do everything I can do quicker. Both twenty three, twenty four, sharper. They just do it, and they've just they've just arrived. Elliot so, has no idea what a Beecham's is, Clive. I mean, I, I, assu- I assume it's something that, that makes the, the sniffles go away. I mean, I can tell from context. I'm not a total idiot. <laughs> Look, the only thing I was going to say, Clive, is I think, you know, when you now have two guys in Aubameyang and Pepe who can run beyond, run off the last shoulder, who can thrive on a through ball a little bit more, you know, Lacazette, I think, likes to drop in short and and play the one-twos and, and turn around in the box and shoot. But, like... If you have Pepe and Aubameyang and you have a three-man midfield that can cover more ground and possess the ball and, and be more vertical, then I think you can accommodate Ozil as the left wide forward, but let him sort of drift into that space between the lines, between the thirds, the, the midfield third and the attacking third, and let him... Because you know what, what was missing in this game and what has been missing in the first two games so far? We've had some opportunities where we've broken the lines, where we played through midfield, and now we're into that final third with numbers and, and in transition... And the ball hasn't been there. And Nelson maybe hasn't been able to play it. And Pepe misplayed it um, at the weekend. I, I realize, look, it's very early doors. But, like, I, I do think that maybe, and maybe it winds up being Ceballos' role more, or maybe, um, you know, it, it, it's something that Pepe will start to do as he gets fit. I, I Obviously, there's still a lot of ways that this could go. But you saw it with Ganduzi, the, the play where he took the shot. And it was a decent shot, saved low by the leg. But he had, he had a through ball into Aubameyang that he missed just the moment before that. I, I still think we're missing the dagger ball player, the player who can play that little that little ball okay. on the edge of the box into those into those um, those pacey uh, forwards in Pepe and Aubameyang. So, I mean, you don't think Ozil could do that? The funny thing is, Mkhitaryan uh, I, does it a little bit. It's just he does everything else wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't dismiss you know, Ozil's ability. Right, I'm having a joke there, but that's how players feel when when you get a performance like that, and two players come in and do a lot of things that you can do. You've got to react to it. So that's that's just a, the hierarchy of the dressing room. He's going to have to train well and play well. Simple as that to create a new balance. But while you're saying that, and you're absolutely right offensively. If you all close our eyes now and have these offensive pictures, well, why why can't Meza Ozil have an impact? However, we still conceded a number of shots in this game. I know it's a bit more territory football. You give up something when you have to play him, right? So we're all talking about the midfield control we had and how we solved problems and how we manipulated the ball and how we controlled that space whenever and wherever we wanted to for good, decent periods of the game. I'm not. That wasn't all done with flair. That was done with a little bit of hard work, running, knowing when to run long, knowing when to travel, transition. And I, I'm just saying to you, I, I think we started to see something else. Mm. So if you want if you want a part of that show, then you better bring something to the show. Don't turn up to the party without a bottle of wine. Bring it all. Bring it all. Bring crisps as well. And let's see what you got. And that's 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 the challenge, right, for Meza Ozil right now. You you better bring some crisps, right? <laughs> Real nice special ones. And start delivering. And start delivering. No more of this sniffles rubbish. Start delivering because players 
are making you disappear from people's minds really quickly. Take yeah. your Beecham's, bring the crisps. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, honestly, it's all foreign language to me at this point, but I'm, I'm still prepared to go with it. Uh, so let's talk about just a, a couple of little details from this game. I mean, one thing that I know a lot of people, Tim, are sort of freaking out about a little bit is that we did concede 18 shots at home to Burnley. I mean, we are a team that conceded too many shots and too many big chances last season. We did it again. Um, I think if you dig into it a little bit, though, nine of them were from set pieces. You know, eight of them were headers. They did only get, what, five on target. Um, I mean, again, still more than you'd like, but, you know, just worth mm. worth pointing out. Um, the goal initially, I mean, maybe looked like Louise w- was sinking too deep and played him on side, but if you watch it a second time, I think that that's a really harsh deflection that takes the ball yeah. screaming on Ashley Barnes's foot in perfect position to score in a situation where all the angles were covered otherwise. So I think he's a little unfortunate there. Do you... Do you feel that this was another example of us just really struggling to suppress shots, or do you have some sympathy for the fact that it's a lot of long balls, it's a lot of set pieces, it's a lot of just what Burnley do? They they are good at creating chances from those situations, but those chances are you know not necessarily the ones that you're as concerned about. I think it's a bit of both, really. So I I, I completely take your point. So first of all, like I said um, earlier, I think Burnley are a much better attacking side than they're given credit for. Look at their score, particularly at home, and we all know they're slightly better at home. Look at their scores at home. They don't just win 1-0 and sit back. Like They're beating teams by two and three goals the last year or so, uh, or 18 months. I do, I do think there's been some evolution. And, and it, you know, it's a real shame, I think, that... Um, Sean Dyche has got such a chip on his shoulder because I actually think he's a really good manager and he's doing a really good job. And I I think he's taking credit away from himself by being such an inveterate fucking whinger. <laughs> um, and I, I didn't like well, especially really when a... I'll just cut you off because it's, it's, yeah, I haven't yeah. done it in a while in this podcast, but I just um, I can understand whining and moaning if your team is whiter than white and the other team is using the dark arts but like maybe there was a dive or two i didn't really see it but even if there was what about all the knees in the back the over the ball challenges the barging the the pushing into the hoardings i mean ganduzi i think it was took a knee from ashley barnes in the back that didn't even get a call if if the ref had been quicker with the yellow cards in this game they could have been down to 10 or 9 men you know with on the hour mark yeah, and they get yeah, yeah. their own playing for free kicks. I mean, that's yeah. part of their tactic. So, like, you know. Yeah, big time. Like, Ash- Ashley Bonds, is he's very good at doing that. Like, you know, I I don't have a massive... I, I do have a problem with, like, shoving players into on-rushing goalkeepers and, you know, snide, cowardly knees in the back. Like, none of that's, like, tough either. Because, like, what's, what's, like, tough or hard about kneeing a guy in the back when he can't even see you like it's just unbelievably cowardly or like lobbing someone into an onrushing goalkeeper and putting two people in danger who can't defend themselves like that's not that's not bravery that's like that's, it's just not um but like I, I don't have a problem with the way burnley play um you know they they use their advantages very well and i you know they, they came and they were really positive like they played a very high line they attacked a lot when we were one nil up you know when they equalized how did you feel you felt like yeah that was coming really that wasn't mm-hmm. out of the blue like they caused a lot of problems going forward um and, and i do think that they're a better team than than people realize and and they kind of you know and, and emery spoke about having to adapt because i think he was kind of caught off guard a little bit by by the high press um so i, I yeah I, I think you're right i think we did struggle to deal with them a little bit on set pieces. We perhaps haven't quite got that authority there. We perhaps saw Bern Leno's slight weakness there. I, I still don't, I, he's got like terrific reactions and I, I do like him. I've really, really warmed to him, but I, I still felt like in this game, he, you know, under his crossbar, you know, he didn't always look entirely comfortable. And, and you know, most goalkeepers don't. I don't think it was a massive deal. It wasn't quite, you know, he wasn't having a meltdown or anything. But I, I just don't think that's quite his strength. But, yeah, I still think there's an issue there with, with kind of shot suppression. I, I I was reflecting on the way home and I was kind of, you know, looking at Twitter and looking at the kind of like some of the metrics were flashing up. And on XG, I think XG had this as 1.3, 1.3. 
um, which I think was about right. I do think it was a fairly even game, to be honest. But You know what that doesn't take into account, though? It doesn't take into account Nelson's goal that's just fractionally offside. Yeah, and it doesn't yeah, take yeah. into account the Pepe Pepe's. Aubameyang break. Where yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. And um, but at the same time, I, I kind of got reflecting and I was thinking that, you know, this happens really often that we're kind of we we are either outshot by or we concede lots of shots and have a low number of shots. And I started thinking, like, I wonder because, you know, we, we look at that and I think a lot of us, you know, think, oh, well, that's that's a problem. And uh, I wonder how much of a problem Emery thinks it is. Um, I, I, I'd be fa- I, like, I don't know the answer. I'm not saying he doesn't find it a worry, but I'd be really interested to know. It, he must look at those numbers and see them, like whether whether they concern him or whether he thinks it's something he needs to correct or whether he thinks, no, I've got two really, really good strikers, so I don't have to go absolutely gun ho and have everyone out of position because these guys will score me a goal. So I can afford to... You know, I don't have to do like the old Arsene Wenger, let's put any old fucker at fullback for the last <laughs> 10 minutes when we need a goal and just throw everyone forward. You know, he maybe he's just thinking, I, I don't have to do that. I've got two world-class centre forwards, so, you know, and I've, now I've got Pepe as well, so I don't have to throw everyone out of shape. So I, I'd be curious to know, and I don't have an answer or even a theory, how much of a problem Emery finds that, whether the shot volume that we've shot we concede is a problem or whether the, um, you know, I don't know what the shot quality is of those shots, you know, whether they're all just like punts from range or, you know, or whether they or, or where they originate from or whether that should matter. Um, so, I, I, you know, like I said, I don't really have a theory on that. I, I'm sure I'd like it to go down, um, you know, and I and I think I think we kind of saw that maybe we're quite not quite used to David Luiz yet. Like I say, like just from that kind of playing out perspective, I, I didn't think we really used that enough um, because I, I kept, you know, when we had that like period in the second half where they kept pen, penning us in and we kept just trying to find Pepe or Willock and they were just, you know, coughing up the ball because they couldn't get out. I, I kept looking at it and I was just thinking, why don't they just pass it to David Luiz and why doesn't he just like whack it over the top? He's probably the best in the world at doing that. And I felt like we lulled Burnley in, you know, and I was thinking, okay, we've done this a couple of times now and now they've really, really got the scent of blood. So let's switch it up and go over the top of them. And I I don't really understand why we didn't do that. And maybe Mm. that's just like a bit of a once, you know, Louise settles in a little bit more once the bios settles in a bit more, you know, made the point about the midfield three are all fairly new. Maybe when they feel like they have a bit more authority or license or they're used to each other, they will be able to deviate from the plan sometimes and think, do you know what? I'm going to use my better judgment here. Cause I think Louise said in his, his post-match, he kind of said, you know, it was important to, to stick to the plan and, and, you know, maybe as he grows into the team a bit more, he'll think, yeah, do you know what? This hasn't worked the last two or three times in the last five minutes. So let's keep them sucked in. And then I'm just going to wallop it over the top yeah. um, for one of the front three. So m- maybe that will come in time. Um, or, you know, or maybe Leno will think, mm, yeah, OK, I've played with David Luiz 15, 20 times now. I can tell him to fuck off. I'm going long. Um, <laughs> maybe, you know, there's just a natural politeness when you're fairly new teammates, you know. Yeah. Um, so I maybe think, I think this you're right, Tim. work it out. We, we just need to fade it over that first line. You've sucked yeah. him in. Fade it over. And yeah. we've got the ability to do it, unlike Peter Cech. But we yeah. didn't. So I don't think it's skill. I think it was decision making. I think we got, we just got trapped at passing it to the nearest man a little bit, and yeah. it, we got away with it. it. Didn't get, but it, it didn't feel comfortable, did it, in the game? And when, and when he did go long late in the game, the crowd sort of ironically cheered, which tells you we're, there was a level of nervousness about our decision making back there, although yeah. we didn't get caught. So I saw a stat and, that said we played out from the back thirty-five times over the first. It's it's the most of games. any goalkeeper in the Premier League so far through the season. We've we've played from our short from our goalkeeper more than anybody else in the Premier League. Yeah, and the nearest was twenty five. I mean, that's a huge difference when you think of the Liverpool and City. I think we're around well, seventeen, so we're like doing a double and to if, add extremists, basically. If you look at Chelsea at the moment as well, they're having massive mm-hmm. problems with it for similar reasons because they've got to, you know they've got Christensen and Zuma playing centre back, and they've got new guys in midfield and. You know, they're getting caught 
um, at the back at the moment. And again, maybe it's the same for them as it is for us. Maybe that they'll work it out in time. I think it's the same for a lot of teams. And the reason what's happening is this new restart rule where you can receive the ball in your area is, is almost encouraging more of this. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So you can have two players in, you can have a touch, and then basically, as soon as you have a touch, they have to, they can come inside the area. So you're almost encouraging that ability to suck people in. You pop it around in your third and you get it over. The problem is that teams are sneaking up on people, they're pressing people, it's early in the season, people are not quite sure if they're touched. First home game, I think this will get better. I don't see a lack of ability that we had last year with the players. I see the ability there, but maybe the decision making not quite polished yeah. yet. I, I will tell you something, and this is to Tim's point, you know, and it makes sense. In the first half, Socrates was as active or slightly more active pass actually more active passing out from the back and had more passes than Louise. And it was exactly flipped in the second half. And it's Louise's first That's start, right? And it just over time, what happens? The better player, the better passer starts to take a little more control, starts to take more command, starts to get the ball more. In the first half, Louise received many fewer passes from Leno. In the second half, Louise received far more passes from Leno than Socrates. So even in the span of one game between the two halves, Leno started, uh, Louise started to grow into it and that, that understanding started to develop. And you look at the way that changes the passing network. And by the way, I'm taking this from passing network graphics that are in our Discord stats channel. And the, on, and the Discord, there have been some unbelievable graphics being posted and put up that are really, really incredible. But um, you, you look at it and you can really see that once Louise gets on the ball, the dynamic totally changes in terms of the passing networks. Willick's five yards further up. Ceballos is 10 yards further up. Um, you know, Ganduzi comes into the game more at, at the halfway line. And, and Luis was clearly a little more vertical with his passing once he received it from Leno than, than Socrates was. And you can see that in the Discord if you're over there. And if you're not, no big deal. Um, we'll start to wrap up. But, Paul, we should talk about how the game changes to when... Um, when we switch to the back three. And you know I think the back three needs to be killed with fire, but to be fair to Clive, I think it served its purpose in this game. And, you know, look, when you have the lead, sometimes it's okay to just kill off the game. I mean, we don't love it because we don't think we're good at it. But here's what's interesting. Another graphic in that Discord channel is the timing map of shots. So right before we switch to the back three, Barnes and McNeil, 67 minutes and 70 minutes, had really good chances one from a corner, one from across, both headers, 10% chances, which on XG is pretty high. That's when he switches to the back three. And at that point, they create nothing. Two headers off a free kick that were basically worthless, 2% chances, and a, a wild chance from Rodriguez worth nothing. The back three did its job in this case. It it did kill off the game. I mean, do you think that Emery deserves credit for making the switch when he did, reacting to the fact that we looked like we were starting to be a little vulnerable and that that got us over the line? Uh, I do. Um, uh, I'd be tending to to do a bit of narrative that, hey, what he was really doing was practicing something similar for the Liverpool game. But in fact, we had enough problems in this game just keeping Burnley under control. Um, it probably doesn't need that extra rationale for why he switched to it. I also thought it was interesting in that Although looking back on it, it was clearly a three at the back. It felt still felt quite four four two ish because Kalasinac was kind of pushed up into midfield and Monreal was covering the space behind him. So it wasn't this huge distortion of how we played. I thought it was potentially interesting as well when people talk about who the three might be. I think this is your three at the back at the moment. Uh, Chambers would miss out. The nice thing is, so uh, my expectation is. That will probably go uh, four two three one or four three three against Liverpool um, with Nacho at left back because at the appropriate time in the game like this he can swing back to a three at the back uh, by just bringing the one player on and I'm hoping we go four four three three against Liverpool and really try and match them in midfield rather than three four three or three four two one and uh, hand them the advantage over midfield because I think as you've talked about the midfield is where you the one place where Liverpool looks a bit more average I mean they're still pretty bloody good and very effective with it in terms of how they use it but if we can if we can use that this three-man midfield 
and the manager can use that excuse looking at at Liverpool to say, hey, these three guys clicked and they deserve, they've earned the next start. I think that could be the way to start against Liverpool. And at some stage, he looks to transition to three at the back to hold on to a draw, or maybe we've even got our nose in front sometime in the second half. Um, it, it did work in this game. Liverpool will be a whole other challenge, but I don't know you want to try and go 90 minutes ag- uh, inviting Liverpool into those pockets behind your your uh, wing backs. Yeah, well said, uh, Tim. You have any follow up on that? Just in terms of how you you feel that worked out, and and if you think that could be something that we're relying on more, especially when we're trying to kill games. So what? Going to a back three? Yes. Um, I I'm not a fan of the idea of uh, moving to a back three to kind of see a game out. Um, I, I think it can disrupt uh, the chemistry um, a little bit. It can change things and confuse things. I remember when we played Palace a few years ago, and we were two 0 up with a couple of minutes to go, and we brought Gabriel. Excuse me, we brought Gabriel on uh, to play. I think alongside Mertesacker and Koscielny, and we were completely comfortable. And then straight away we conceded, and then Glenn Murray hit the post in the last minute, and it completely threw us off. Moving to a back three for the last kind of couple of minutes so i'm i'm not a massive fan of it unless you are absolutely like i don't know it's like cup final and you are absolutely all hands to the pump um at the last minute kind of and and you know this is like last straw uh kind of thing so you know home to burnley for example I, i wouldn't necessarily do that i just think when perhaps when there's a couple of minutes left and you just know you're under pressure and that's the end of it and you can't get out that's the only circumstance in which I do that. Otherwise, I think you run the risk of confusing things and inviting pressure. I, I think when it comes to defences, really, you should you should have some um, some consistency there and, and you should really kind of... It, it's a bit like, you know, no one ever subs defenders, right? Unless they're injured. And that's, that's for a good reason because you kind of need continuity and chemistry there. So... Um, I th- I think if you start with a back four, you play it the whole time, and and ditto a back three. I I think maybe I guess you move from a three to a four more easily because, uh, and again, that's reliant on game state. Because if you think you're dominating or you think you need to dominate, and you think right, okay, we don't really need the third centre half here. We're on top. We need a goal. You know, let's get rid of them, and we're not really defending much anyway. Um, but I actually I think when you're under pressure, swapping from two centre backs to three centre backs confuses things unless you are absolutely kind of under the Alamo. Mm. All right. Well, it worked in this case. <laughs> I mean, you know, you take you take what you can get. I, I do. I do think that I agree with you. Um, but I'm going to give credit where it's due because the outcome was good. Maybe the process wasn't. Clive, uh, one last thing from this game: we did get to see Torreira play. You know, he yeah. looked spry and lively, new haircut. Um, any thoughts on his introduction and whether he looks ready for you to be a candidate to start at Liverpool or no? He, he looks a little bit off for me. He, his shirt was a bit big. <laughs> I think he, he's come down the size. He's just back from his holidays, and, and I thought he did quite well when he came on, actually. If you base it on the shot and the fact he scurries around and, and gets in the way of things, then he got pushed into his goalkeeper unfairly. Um, I like the player, again, he just needs to get fit, and I think he'll be a very active hand grenade to put around the pitch that we could use. Um, again, we're not talking about a quality issue here, are we? We're not talking about the quality issues we've spoken about in the past. Um, we, we, we're we talking about a good player not quite ready to play. We're talking about you know, David Luiz, a really good player, playing his first game and improving during that game. I mean, we've got Pepe that's come in at 20 minutes last week, 45 this week. We know he's only 60% ready. Right? Lacazette's not quite ready. The only one that is ready is probably a Bamiyang, and he looks it. He looks more ready than anybody. Um, so, yeah, it is, it is hugely promising as a whole. Um, and the team is developing. And that's the exciting thing. It's developing into something else that we all called for, a new dynamic, a new new full spring, problem-solving midfielders, forwards that frighten people, forwards that have that swagger. We're going to get tested now in away games. 
when we walk into their into their grounds and they're going to want to smash us early and take away our confidence i really want to see us start quickly and go there with confidence and see what we can do and make them see our new talent and make them adjust to us because i think we can do that if we have the the right level of belief and um i must admit one last thing Elliot, when we went to the back three you did you did cross my mind i must admit and i was thinking crikey let's not this better work because otherwise the narrative will be Emery's negative. He went to negative formation. He went to five at the back, not three at the back. We had the game in our pocket and we lost it. But actually, I felt it. The Monreal, I thought, was excellent towards the end of the game. He made numerous headed clearances. And I just think he gave a level of aerial confidence to Louise and Socrates just by squeezing in 10 yards. And that's all we really did. Took off a tired forward who was who was who was getting tired, added a bit of spring on the left hand side and added another defender in the box. And I love those sort of decisions, particularly when they work. I hope he's not any I like any coach, if you feel something in a game state, you should have the confidence to do it. And your players should be aware that's a scenario that could happen. And they seem to be aware of it and it and it worked out really well. Yeah, look, I mean, uh it is early enough in the season that I'm not gonna complain about anything, if you can believe that. Give me a week. Um, real, real quick as we get out of here. Who you got starting at Liverpool? Make the big call. Is that me? Yeah, that you first. Me we'll, first. We'll give everybody a, a quick shot at it. Okay, I like you know I like Paul's thought process about the four three three. I would go with the same back five. Obviously, I'd actually go with a lot of the same team. I, I'm I'm conscious this is Anfield. I'm conscious are. Uh, Captain in waiting <laughs> could come into that team. I'm not sure who for. Um, I just feel that Willock's energy is going to be required um, in this game. I just I think thought he was made... really good in in the game against Burnley. Yeah, exactly. I've just think I love his just. He he has a, set, a game which is based on normalcy. He just does normal things really well. You know, no, I need to run here. I'm running there. A flick here, it's flicked there. He does exactly what you think he's going to do, and he does it quite well. And I, I like that about him. So I would go, I would go with the same team. I wouldn't even be, I would almost go, even the very same team wouldn't bother me if Nelson started. It wouldn't bother me. I think we're still building minutes for Pepe. If Pepe started, Nelson finished. Doesn't bother me. Again, we've got the right dynamic and right talent, so I wouldn't be I wouldn't be upset if it's exactly the same team. Okay, Paul? Uh, I'm with Clive. I'd start the same team with maybe one difference. I might bring Mkhitaryan on. Uh, for Nelson? It, it, yeah. People are going to uh, scream at you for that, but I actually kind of agree. I, I think, he, I think yeah. he, he can do more of the, the hard stuff. I, you know, the funny thing that's underrated about Mkhitaryan is he's fairly intense defensively. He, he does yeah. do that part of the game pretty well. Um, so otherwise and, and the then, same? Yeah, and I'd make the same change with Pepe at halftime. I think that's that's a really good audition for how to play against Liverpool. How about you, Tim? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I I completely agree with that. Actually, I I I'd probably put Mkhitaryan in and you know run his legs uh, or now or Nelson. I wouldn't I wouldn't be um, adverse to that. Run their legs off for sixty minutes and then have Pepe for the last half an hour. Um, I, I'd go with the same midfield. I don't think that's what Emery is going to do. I've got a feeling he's going to go to a back three, um, uh. push Monreal in as a centre <laughs> half, have Kalasinac and Maitland Niles. Um, I think he'll want to get Xhaka back in there and yeah. then um, put Abamyang and Lacazette up front. I the thing I think about this game is I think I've looked at Liverpool this season. They haven't impressed me defensively at all. I think. Some teams have found some gaps, some places that they can exploit. Right and um, Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And I, I think this is one game where I'd, I'd certainly play a Bamiyang wide left, actually, because yeah. I think there's a space. If we can get out and get over Liverpool's press, I think there's a space that we can 
we can hit there. And um, I'm 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 actually pretty confident that we can create a lot of chances against Liverpool. I think on balance they're probably going to create more, unfortunately. But um, I, I think we'll score in this game. I think we could score a couple in this game. I just unfortunately think we might concede a couple. But I think that Emery will go with the back three at first, with a view to bringing Pepe on for the last half an hour and maybe shifting things, depending on how what the game state is on 60 minutes. Yeah, I, I mean it's interesting. Look, I I kind of I find myself agreeing with you, and then I look at it, and Liverpool conceded like twenty shots at home last season, or something stupid like that. Like it's really insane how much they suppress chances and shots. I'd want a hard running front line. I'd consider going Aubameyang, Mkhitaryan, and Pepe across the front three, and playing the same midfield. Let them try to wriggle out of pressure and get it forward to those guys and let them just run their legs off at the Liverpool defense, pushed up, you know, in our half or, or trying to keep us hemmed in. Um, I, I'd leave Lacazette on the bench. I, you know, I, I know this starts to feel like bias and it ultimately our, our feelings about all this stuff are biased, but I think that the Lacazette and Aubameyang thing together can work when you have a lot of deep possession because Lacazette can drop in a little bit, get the ball with his back to goal and distribute and then run into the box. But when you have very little possession. Now look, it could work the other way, which is that because we don't have a lot of possession and because we're playing a little deeper, you need Lacazette to be a focal point. You know, someone that you can get the ball out to so you have an out ball and without him, we might not have an out ball. So I I could see it both ways. This is a very, very tricky fixture and ultimately it's free money. I hope the team approaches it like free money in the sense that the pressure is entirely on Liverpool. They have to win every game to win this league. We, We can go to Anfield and play with some freedom. We can't allow 5-1 like we had last season, but I don't think we're in line for that. So I'd be fine if he sticks with the same lineup, although I I just think that maybe maybe Nelson is is slightly in over his head at that level, but I you know I'm I'm happy to you know let the kid work through it. I just don't know if that might be a a bit much at this stage. We'll see. Ultimately I, I believe having watched us play and having watched them play that they are still the better team, but that the gap is not at this specific moment, is not what it was at this time last year. So we we should be able to give ourselves a, a better account of ourselves. And here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll do a, a Patreon pod midweek, but then we'll do a, a live uh, show later in the week really focusing on Liverpool, so there'll be more time to talk about that. I think we'll leave cool. it there. Uh, yeah, why, Clive? You have more to say? I, I imagine. No, you know I'm, what? I'm looking forward to a Liverpool preview. I got more in my head. But well, we're going to be doing it. We'll save for, it. We'll save it for that. Save the date. Send out save the date cards. Pick out your favorite dress. We're going to be doing it. Uh, Tim's on Twitter. At Stilberto. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure as always. Paul's on Twitter. Pause in my pants. Thanks, pause. Woo-hoo. Clive's on Twitter. At Clive P A F C. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. My name's Alex Smith. You can block me on Twitter. Yankee Gunner. Give us a five star review. Right next things about Scott, who will be on the midweek Patreon pod in the, the Liverpool preview, so he'll be back as well. Hey, we love you. We really appreciate you uh, hanging with us for the start of the season. It's been a good start. Perfect start. Six points. And now just a small matter of uh, taking another six from our next two, and we should be in good position to win the title. So uh, we'll take a break. we got a lot more coming up later this week, and we will talk to you after Arsenal 10, Liverpool nil. 